Today we're going to be doing Industrial Revolution um, Part 1. There's also Part 2 for this week. And this is the thesis. While a very few enjoyed immense wealth at the expense of the very poor, others called progressives work to improve the lives of the impoverished. So as you know, last week we did the middle class with the Victorian era. Today we'll be talking about the very wealthy and then the very poor. And then um, starting today, but also mostly the next video, we'll be doing um, others called progressives who are trying to improve things. So we did see how the middle class was doing, but um, just as we studied the housing and the work of the middle class, we're going to be looking at the housing and the work of the lower class. And of course, not everyone lived that way. So um, this is a picture of what's called a, as you can see in the lower left hand corner, a dumbbell tenement. And it was called a dumbbell tenement because it looks like a dumbbell, but this was actually the result of a contest to see how could we best um, house our, you know, lower class. And there could be, you know, maybe four families in each one of these quarters, um, and then they maybe would take in borders. But the problem also was that they didn't have a sanitation system. So um, they would throw the trash down, um, you know, down the sides. So um, this is a picture of a woman who's living in um, one of these houses. And I used to think um, that she was embarrassed, but actually um, my boss at El Camino pointed out that you don't stand that way if you're embarrassed. You know, you stand with your hand on your hip when you're proud. And so she was proud. Here also is another family who I believe are pretty proud of their circumstances. You can see they're all, you know, dressed in their best, right? Dressed in their Sunday best. Now, um, a lot of the lower class are going to be using their homes to work. And we're going to be talking about um, a museum that is in New York called the Tenement Museum, um, where the lower class use their homes um, for, let's say, sewing, or here they are making flowers to be sold on the street. <clears throat> and um, what's neat about this museum um, that you can visit, it's on you know one of the most famous streets in the Lower East Side in New York, um, Orchard Street is that they have a tenement uh, apartment where some people from the 1880s live and another one where the 1900s live. So in the 1880s, um, they took in borders. They, um, they had a bunch of sewing machines and um, they did all their work, you know, in the kitchen and they would hire people to make dresses. So the dresses would sell to the stores for 75 cents and then the stores would sell it for $15. But the family in the 1880s that did that, they actually were able to move to Brooklyn, which remember we talked about that being a suburb. The people in the 1900s, um, their daughter worked at the Triangle Shirtwaist um, factory. We're going to talk about that later, um, where she had to rent a space to work. That's how it worked then. Can you imagine renting a space so you were able to work? Um, but anyways, they took in boarders, and all the boarders would sleep with their head on the sofa and their bodies on the floor. But that family um, did not do as well. So the kind of work that they're doing is marginal, part-time, and seasonal. So there's no guaranteed work, right? I mean, you can see that it's very dangerous. Here they are working down in some mines. Um, a group of women that were not like the Victorian ladies who were at home or shopping the working ladies were the Irish girls, and we talked about them um, with the immigrants. Um, later on, it's going to be African American women who are going to be working as servants, and the African American women, a little different because they do not live in the home um, that they're working at, just like the, the Irish girls live in the home. But with African American women, what would happen is um, you would there would be two different levels. One that would um, have to wear a uniform and need to go to the same house every day, and then the upper kind of level were women that would wear whatever they wanted to. And they could go home and they could, you know, just be um, cleaning while the people are gone. So that was kind of an upper level of, of household servant. So kind of a fun question is, I think I've asked before, is, you know, who had more power? Was it the woman who's ordering them around or was it the women that are making the money? So again, I'm um, dealing with women and children. Um, here's a young boy that is working in a coal mine and some um, kids that are working um, at kind of a Lowell uh, plant where we talked about Lowell, where they are making cloth. Here's another girl working at um, like a, uh, a materials, you know, a tapestry kind of place. 
Um, this guy is a shrimp picker. Um, here's some young um, boys that are maybe working in a coal mine or something. Here's some kind of tough boys and they're um, selling newspapers. So um, question one is going to be two parts. So child labor was thought to be a solution. And for what? I'd like for you to kind of brainstorm on that. So who would like child labor? And secondly, who would, what would um, opposers argue? People that are against child labor, please don't say that they cared about the kids. Think about people that don't care about the kids but would be against child labor. So kind of think, why would they be against child labor? Whose job are they taking, right? Okay, question two is, um, this is all political and social contributors. So how do we get to this place of child labor and women labor and, you know, these horrible conditions? Well, one of the reasons is because of social Darwinism. And if you're familiar with Charles Darwin, The Origin of the Species, remember it's survival of the fittest. So this transformed into what would be the belief of social Darwinism, right? And who would be an advocate or for this belief. Who would think that social Darwinism, remember so survival of the fittest, but more in a social way, who would think this was a good idea? That's question two. And that again can be some more brainstorming, right? Okay, so this is social Darwinism. I'll kind of give you the answer. So you could see the rich people are at the, you know, the other end, right? Okay, so somebody like Andrew Carnegie, and you'll be able to look at his source. He was one of the richest men, you know, around. Um, Look at how Mr. Carnegie justifies his great wealth. What does he argue is its best use? So you'll be able to look in the source for that. These are what are called the robber barons. We have Rockefeller, Vanderbilt, Carnegie, J.P. Morgan. Um, they did donate quite a bit, um, but, you know, they were super, super rich. And um, please know, though, that most of them came into this country extremely poor and, you know, worked their way, clawed their way to the top. Okay, so this is John Rockefeller, and what we're going to see here is monopoly, right? So he has a monopoly of trains, and then he's standing on oil. So if somebody is going to compete against him, um, he can say, you know, no, I'm not going to give you oil, or I'm going to knock my prices down to nothing so you can't survive. So that is a political and social contributor to this child labor. This is um, what their homes look like. And if you go to New York, you go across Central Avenue, Fifth Avenue, um, Central Park, Fifth Avenue, um, you can see these homes. So I'm, I'm going to give you some information, and then I'm going to have you kind of rewrite a little paragraph on what I'm saying. But um, one reason why we get these horrible conditions is somebody like Boss Tweed. Boss Tweed was just an example, but he was kind of the worst example. And I'm going to give you some terms, and then I need you to include this. Um, these three terms need to be in your answer for full credit. So um, Boss Tweed um, ran something called Tammany Hall, and what would happen in Tammany Hall is immigrants would go to go there to get jobs or to get housing, but Tammany Hall was not like a government institution. Um, what they said is, we'll give you a job, we'll give you housing, you know, we'll help you with food, but you need to vote how we tell you to vote. So what would happen is these immigrants, you know, like the Irish, they came from very corrupt, you know, area. Italians came, you know, just corrupt, right? They don't care who they're going to vote for. They're not used to any kind of honest elections anyways. So what they do is they vote for Boss Tweed, and he becomes the Commissioner of Public Works. And what that means is he will know, for example, where the sewer lines are going. So what he would do is he would buy up the land beforehand. That's illegal now, but that was legal then. And then he would sell that same land to the city. And on top of that, he would do something called kickbacks. So what would happen is he needs to furnish, um, let's say, the museum or whatever, or the library. The library was a very... Um, corrupt, <laughs> very corrupt on how it was built and whatever. But he would say, let's say to somebody, he'd say, okay, you sell chairs. I know you say you want to sell them for $5. Well, I'm going to tell you, you really need to sell them to me for $50. Then he would tell the government, I need $50 per chair. And then he would give that chair person $20. And then he would pocket, you know, $30 himself. So those are called kickbacks, right? He's kicking back, um, some of the corrupt money. So he stole, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars um, from the government this way. And then what ended up happening is he, um, they finally caught on to him and finally said enough. I mean, they knew what was going on, but people just put up with it. And he was put in a jail that he actually had built. So he um, was able to escape. And then he went to Spain. And this picture here, 
and other pictures were drawn by somebody called Thomas Nast, N-A-S-T. People in Spain saw these cartoons and then saw him, and they had him arrested, and he actually ended up dying on penniless and in one of the jails again. So if you're running a campaign for Boss Tweed, what would you say? How would you remind people they need to vote for him? Please include these points, right? Tammany Hall, remember, Commissioner of Public Works and Kickbacks. Or you could just do it as why you should not vote for him. You can do that too. That's a little bit easier. Okay, so another contributor is how people were treated. Um, and with the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, um, you can actually still go there, um, see the building. It's next to New York University. It's kind of a it's kind of a triangle shape, but um, as you can see from the picture down here. But what happened is the unions were not able to get in, um, and the managers locked the doors from the outside so the girls could not leave, and the and yeah, and they could not you know converse with the the union people. So what happened is you know it's a it's a material, right? They're making um, shirtwaists. They're making um, outfits for young ladies. And so there was a match that fell or something like that. And then there was a huge fire. And the girls, first off, the fire escapes, you know, fell. Um, then um, they, the elevator, you know, wasn't working. Um, and the managers were able to escape on the top roofs, right? Um, seventh and eighth floor, I believe it was, or eighth through tenth or something like that, because the New York University students were helping them. But the fire trucks had just gotten new ladders and they could not reach up to where the girls were. So the girls started throwing themselves over. And unfortunately, there was like some gates down below. So they would, you know, be um, plummeted into these, you know, gates and whatever. Um, but it was 148 um, girls that died. Or look, it says 150. I thought it was 148. Whatever, either one. Okay, so what you're going to read is Rose Hauser, and she was um, part of this tragedy, but she got away. So what were some of Rose's traumatic experiences? And then second part, imagine that you're a union worker. How could you use this tragedy to fight for better conditions? Okay, so some of the solutions. We talked about some of the contributing problems. Some of the solutions, um, we have communism, um, socialism that starts at this point. Um, people start talking about, you know, hey, what's going on in Russia, and maybe we need to be doing this too. Um, this is just kind of a fun way to understand communism, right? Kind of like the Smurfs, you know, everybody dresses the same and has different jobs. Um, unions, um, that was a big one. So, um, so then we also have muckrakers. And Teddy Roosevelt is, um, I think he's president at this time. So he's frustrated with a growing group of journalists who concentrated on exposing graft and corruption. He called them muckrakers. Although he also was very concerned with all this, but muckrakers are from um, John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, where the muckrakers are um, still worried about the muck around them that they forget about the celestial crown. But anyway, so um, what is going on is usually in, pic in newspapers they would have these pictures, but then somebody like Lewis Hine comes along and he says, no, we need to have photographs. So he took a lot of photographs. That's kind of a fun one. But what he could do is he'd go to a, a place and he'd say, can you bring out all of your people so I can take a picture of them? Well, then he's showing that actually there's a lot of children there, right? Um, this is another little girl to milk me. This is one of my saddest pictures. This boy looks like he's three, but he's also like 40 years old or something because he looks like he's been through so much. But um, what we're going to do is take a look at a muckraker, a muckraker um, book um, called The Jungle. And um, I'm going to show you some different sections. And then what I want you to do is to um, comment on them, say, come up with one issue you might fight for if you witnessed or read about this. So let me go through this. There'll be different sections. It's not in your readings. So then you can go back through and pick out the ones you want to do. Okay. So um, lastly, we're going to talk about progressives for a minute. And um, these were some of the accomplishments of the progressives. Um, so progressive, we're going to talk about this a lot more later, is a person advocating or implementing social reform and new liberal ideas. So some of their accomplishments, they did come up with workers' compensation. Um, they did change uh, minimum age from 12 to, six, 12 to 16 years old instead of 3 and 4, right? And they could only work 10 hours a day, 10 hour a day for women, and movement toward old age pensions on state level. So um, what I want you to do is take a look at Samuel Gompers, and what he's going to argue is that it's good to work for eight hours, sleep for eight hours, and just be a human for eight hours. So I want you to look at what his best argument is for that, all right? 
Okay, so again, um, while a very few enjoyed immense wealth at the expense of the very poor, others called progressives work to improve the lives of the impoverished. All right, thank you very much.